Hello everyone, my name is Vanessa and I'm making this video to talk about hearing loss. I've had a severe hearing loss for over 10 years from my childhood and I am planning to get a cochlear implant for one side on my left side and I want to talk about my background and make like a before video before the surgery and explain how I got to this point on why I think this is a good idea for me to get a cochlear implant. And as you can probably tell, I'm not completely deaf. I have like asymmetric hearing loss where I have my left ear is profoundly worse than my right ear. And in my right ear, I have lost mainly like low tones, like your bass or like I have a hard time hearing like men's voices. I can hear like higher pitches much better. And I'm thinking about getting the cochlear implant just for my left ear. So the reason I wanted to make this video is because it's been only like in the past couple of years that they even started doing cochlear implants for single-sided deafness. It's kind of a new approach to the hearing society, I guess. And I wanted to relate this experience because I watched a bunch of people's YouTube videos um, about their experience, and that's what helped convince me that this was a good idea. So to backtrack a bit, I want to talk about my background. So I've had hearing loss since around like fifth grade when I was like about 10 years old. And I remember having a sudden change where every, or I had a hard time explaining it to my parents. I was like, everything sounds like stuffy. If there's like, feels like there's cotton balls in my ears. Uh, I remember pulling on my ears a lot. I mean like trying to make it like more clear or I could like hear better. And then I also had like this buzzing noise all of a sudden. And I, was, I didn't know what it was and we had like this air ventilation thing in our house and I went over to that and I showed my mom it's like I hear this in my head it sounds like this like there's this buzzing noise and they didn't really understand but eventually they we went to a doctor and they did a hearing test obviously and I was diagnosed with hearing loss so they tried to do some more testing. They were trying to figure out why I was having this problem. I had an MRI done when, and that was a little bit scarier when you're young. You know, you have to like lay in like this tube and you have to be perfectly still and it's very loud and you have to like wear headphones to like protect your hearing. But it like, you have to be perfectly still and then they like pull you out and then they put contrast in because they're they want to look inside and like see it without contrast and then with contrast. So they like inject like this colored liquid into your bloodstream and then they do the uh, MRI screening a second time. Um, and I also, I did a CAT, I had a CAT scan because uh, they were trying to look into everything. So by the end of all this testing, I they told me that I had uh, EVA or enlarged vestibular aqueduct, which can be like, a, it's just a part of the inner ear. It could be like genetically larger. Um, so I, I did some like research on this and some articles I read that said that this may not be like the direct link to why I have hearing loss. It just may be like, um, a stepping stone of why and more recently a doctor told me it could just be I just have some genetic problems where it just progressively is getting worse or I just don't have a very clear explanation on why I have hearing loss but I do know I have hearing loss and at this point it's just better that I just try to treat what's going on than try to dwell on why it's happening. So after we did some research to not the best of results, but uh, they fitted me with a hearing aid and I tried wearing a hearing aid on 
my both my ears like a normal hearing aid where you amplify sound but of course on my left ear it wasn't working very well because I had lost so much hearing there wasn't a lot left to amplify it was just wasn't doing me any good it was more distracting than helpful because it would just like magnify like unimportant sounds and <laughs> It was so like loud that like if you tried to like cup my hand around the hearing aid it would like squeal really loud. So after a while I just I stopped wearing it and I was like this is not helping me. But I I definitely remember struggling a lot in like middle school because I would be in situations where I'd have somebody sitting next to me and I couldn't hear them like and it would be so awkward because I'd be trying to like turn my head be like trying to hear better but it is very difficult because you can't like there's like a they call it the head shadow effect where like it's just like blocking you can't get to the other side <laughs> so of course you can hear some sound but it's just not very clear um, and then a couple of years later I found out about a cross aid and this really changed my life because it helped solve a lot of the problems I was dealing with so if you're not familiar with cross aid I'll explain it has like so I wear a normal hearing aid in my better ear and then I wear a, a different type of hearing aid where it's more like a receiver and it's these two are Bluetooth synced together and it, I wear it on the side and it receives sound and then it sends it to my better side and then I can hear what's going on on this left side. So it helped solve like a huge problem like I, I didn't have to be like dancing around people and like moving around so I could hear them better. That helped a lot on the downside is, is I still have a very hard time telling where sounds coming from in like terms of direction because if somebody's like calling for me and I can't see them but I, I hear them but I don't know what direction they're coming from because I I can't tell like it's it's coming from this side or it's coming from that side I, I, I just have no idea and it's very disorienting sometimes but, you know, you have to accept it. Um, so, however, this, that, that helped me for like a couple of years. Like I was pretty stable. I was like, this is pretty good. I'm happy with how I am. But then recently, more recently, a couple months ago, I had uh, a change in hearing. My, my right side just, uh, it lost more and in the low tones again so i was having a hard time hearing my co-workers at work at times and i think part of it was due to the fact that we all had to wear masks and that tend to uh, muffle people's speech and that made it very hard at times because i just i couldn't understand them uh, and it was compounding with my further loss of hearing so of course I had I had another MRI done to see if there was any changes and they said it it looked normal which is very interesting I don't know what's going on with me but they I went to an ENT doctor and he was he suggested like why don't you get a cochlear implant for your almost deaf ear you sh maybe you should try it. And at first, my, my first reaction was like, no way, I'm not doing it unless I go completely deaf. I'm not going down that road. I w I've always been very scared of it. I just, I didn't want a surgery. I was scared of like having like an external part on my outside. Like I just, as a kid, I just, I didn't want to look strange or be like the oddball out. I mean, it's not as big a deal to me anymore, but at first I was very negative, but then I was struggling at work and I was like, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should look into it more and like give it a chance. So I did and I was like, 
looking online and I saw that there's this cochlear brand and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then typically, um, as far as I'd known for a very long time that uh, cochlear implants have more of like a, an earpiece that like hooks around your ear and then there's a little wire and it attaches it and it magnetizes to your top of your head. Kind of looks like this where this is your earpiece and then it magnetizes there. But when I was looking online, I saw that there is a more like off the ear kind that really intrigued me. Here, let me. So they have this kind here that's just this piece that magnetizes to the outside of your head. And I was like, wow, that they've really decreased the size of this technology since I last looked at it. And I was like, wow, maybe this is worth it. Maybe it's, it's improving. Uh, maybe I should try this. And, but another fear of mine was that it's going to sound horrible. It's going to sound very like mechanical and that I was like, I, I, I don't want to like everything to sound like robots. Like I, I really, really thought that for a very long time, but I was like, maybe it's not as bad as I think. So what helped convince me that the sound quality wasn't as bad as I imagined was when I, I watched a podcast and they did like this study and it was about this person who had a single-sided deafness. They had a cochlear implant on one side and perfectly normal hearing on the other side and they would have this person listen to sounds on the implant side and then on the normal side. And then they would tell the other person to like make adjustments to the original audio until it sounded like what the cochlear implant side. So he would listen to it on both sides and then they would make changes to the audio on his better ear so that they matched. And it's like, so here's what it sounds like on the implant side. So I found that really interesting because like that's the only type of person that can really do that, is somebody who has both situations happening, where they have normal hearing and they have a cochlear implant. And of course, it wasn't perfect, it was like a little bit different, but it was fairly manageable. Um, and I, I found that really interesting and that helped reassure me that it wasn't that bad. Uh, and I also tried to like watch some more other videos on YouTube to just like get people's experiences and there's there's so much content out there and that's part of why I wanted to make this video too just because it helps convince me, it helps me get a better understanding, helps me get people's personal experiences and I think that is so valuable in making this type of decision. So I decided to set up another appointment with the ENT center that I went to previously and this time it was for a cochlear implant testing because you have to be specially tested um, to prove to insurance that it's medically necessary. So I went and spoke to the audiologist and she helped answer like a bunch of my questions. She said that their company uh, specialized only with the cochlear brand uh, which is what I saw online and at first I was fine with that but then she mentioned that uh, the only brand that was FDA approved for single-sided deafness at this point was called Medell and I hadn't heard anything about this before and I was like oh that's interesting and she did she warned me that it's possible that if I submitted for the cochlear brand it might not get improved because they're not FDA approved for it. I mean, she said it might be, but it was, it was up in the air. I was like, well, that's interesting. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the other brands. This is the first time I heard about Medell, but it piqued my interest. And she mentioned that, like I saw online, that Cochlear had an off the ear kind, and it was called the Canzo 2. 
but she told me, oh, Medell also has an off-the-ear kind as well, called Rondo 3. And I was like, oh great, they both have this feature that I'm interested in. Um, and, you know, another thing that was interesting I found out is that you can do streaming. You can, like, Bluetooth stream from, like, your phone to the cochlear implants. And I was like, wow, this is great because I thought, oh, I'll get a cochlear implant and I, I can't like listen to music anymore with headphones and that was a fear of mine for a while it's like I, I still want to be able to like do that like it, it's a very nice feature um, but she also helped to answer some of my questions about the surgery I was like do I have to shave like a large part of my hair um, and she said no it's just they only gonna probably shave like a small section around the ear and that it'll grow back like that it's not something to be like concerned about. Um, she said with like, I asked her about balance and she said I might be a little bit dizzy like after the surgery but nothing like severe and that it should get better. And she said if you're only like operating on one ear and the other side's still intact, the, your brain is really good at like figuring out balance just from like one side. which is just pretty interesting. Um, she said also that I would only probably need like one week of recovery time and that it's an outpatient surgery So that means like I can I can go home the same day. I don't have to like stay overnight at the hospital. It's like oh, this is this isn't as bad as I imagined. It's not as intrusive. It's, it seems fairly manageable So I was glad to hear all this. It's like okay, so let's this she told me let's go ahead with the testing so we did a test and it was a little bit different than what I was used to because I was used to a normal hearing test where you have to like I take out my hearing aids I put headphones in like in my ears and then they would do like a series of tests where I have to like listen to sounds and I push like a button and like respond to them if I hear it and sometimes they would do testing words like they would say, like say the word this and then I have to repeat what that word was but this test was a little bit different because I had to keep my hearing aids in they didn't put any headphones on my ears and I sat in front of like a speaker and like a they put me in like a soundproof room and then they would have different types of people talking they would have men and women speaking and then they would say like sentences or words and I had to repeat them back and then they would do different situations where they would put background noise on to like try to distract me or make it harder for me to hear. And then I would have to try to repeat what they said to me again. And of course I I could sometimes like hear women's voices a lot better and but the men's voices when there was a lot of background noise, I had a lot of or I had a very hard time understanding them. So that I was showing my weakness there. <laughs> and then they would also do situations where I had to, well I, I didn't wear my cross aid and I had to wear a normal hearing aid on my left ear and this was to prove to see if it was effective or not or if it would improve my situation but of course it it was just like as I remembered it of course it amplified sound but it was more distracting than helpful and it didn't really improve my score, probably made it worse, if anything. So at the end of that, she was like, okay, well, we can submit this to insurance, but we we only offer the cochlear brand. It, it may or may not be like approved and like, we'll get back to you. So I was like, I went home and I was like, well, it's a little bit disappointing. I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to even get a cochlear implant now. It's like, well, maybe I should just look into that Medell brand that I was heard about. And I went online and I did some research. Um, and I looked on their company and it, it looked fairly nice. They, had, they seemed to have a lot of the same features that Cochlear had. And it was like, I wonder why this, this brand's FDA approved for like single-sided deafness and the other one's not. So I decided to call them and they... Uh, she gave, they gave me a, 
contact, or I talked to a lady on the phone, and she said their brand really focuses on trying to get like naturalness of sound as much as possible. And she gave me an email address of a person who's like a representative of Medell in my state. So I emailed her and I told her about my condition and that I was like looking into getting a cochlear implant. And she was very responsive, like she responded very quickly. And I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> and she wanted to set up a Zoom meeting. So a couple days later, we set up a Zoom meeting and she was very nice. She helped to answer a lot of my questions and she told me more about Medell brand. And something that really interests me is that uh, they have longer uh, electrodes. So <laughs> maybe I should talk about how I, I learned a little bit more how a cochlear implant works. I don't know if I've, I haven't really discussed how it works up until this point. So I'm going to do that now. Okay. So let's see. I have a picture here. Okay, so there is this piece here, and this is the internal part of the implant, okay? And so they, they implant this part, like this kind of like, it's not really square, but this part into your head. And then, as you see, there's this long wire here. So interestingly, inside your ear, you have a, a cochlea which is very, I find it very interesting, but it's kind of like shaped like a conch shell, like it spirals inwards, uh, here, kind of, you know, looks like this, like it spirals inwards, and this really is an important part of how you hear. So when sound comes in, it comes into your cochlea, and inside the cochlea, there's like these little hair cells, and the hair cells like receive the sound and then they tran or they change it into like electrical impulses that get sent to your brain and then your brain can like interpret the sound and understand like what's going on in the speech but with my hearing loss is uh, when typically when people have hearing loss is those hair cells inside the cochlea don't work or they they've been damaged and they can't uh, take the sound waves and transmit into electrical impulses so the brain doesn't get any messaging that there was sound there and of course it could be this be different levels of damage like some hair cells can be damaged while some other hair cells can be fine so that's why some people can't hear certain sounds but they can hear other sounds uh, so what's also interesting is that the way the cochlea is like laid out. So uh, let's go back to this picture, but in, in the inside of the cochlea, it's all these low tones that like the bass ones. And then as you spiral outwards, it like receives more like higher pitch sounds. So, you know, that's kind of why typically like older people or people who lose their hearing, they tend to like lose these higher pitches more frequently because they're kind of like on the outside and they're more easily can be damaged. So that's when people are like losing their hearing, they typically lose these. My situation is kind of strange because I'm losing the inside ones that I can hear on the outside like better. So that, you know, it's proving that I, I have some like deeper problem going on with genetics like that. I, I am not your typical hearing loss because it's usually people typically lose higher frequencies first but I'm losing like lower tones in my right ear first but to get on point um, the, so the cochlear implant that that long like wire I was showing you earlier it goes inside the cochlea let's see if I have a, a picture I don't know Okay, so see, like, it goes, it curls up inside the cochlea, and this is, it's kind of like a substitute for those hair cells, because 
this wire like sends like little like electrical impulses in that area like what the hair cells would do and it sends it to the brain so it's like a substitute and I it's really I find that interesting but of course then you know there's that outside part like the processor part and that's what receives the sound and then it sends it like a so this part here, it decodes the sound, or it changes the sound into like code that it knows to send to this wire. So it knows to like only send electrical impulses in these certain areas, and so that your brown, your brain receives the correct sound waves. It, and so it sends like only like impulses in like these certain like areas. So it's like, oh, you're. It's like receiving a low tone and it knows to like send an impulse in like the inner part of your code glue or stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, of course it's more advanced than I can explain, but it's fascinating. And something that intrigued me because she told me that the cochlear brand, um, it's the electrodes is shorter. So it's only like 20, or 22 millimeters long, but the electrode, um, sorry, the Medell brand has longer electrodes, and this is kind of their selling point. So this intrigued me. So of course, if you have a longer electrode, you go deeper into the cochlea, then you have, you can hear more sounds. You can, if you get deeper in, because it's. Uh, those lower tones you have and you can stimulate that area you have a better chance of hearing like low tones and it being a little bit closer to like natural sound if you're because with the cochlear brand it might be a little bit more high pitched because they're only getting like more of like the outside part of the cochlea so it might sound a little bit more higher pitched than the Medell brand so I was like wow this is really interesting I, I think this might be my convincing point of like why I want to get Medell versus the Cochlear brand because I, I really I really wanted it to sound like normal I I was already losing like low tones in my right ear and it was like it'd be great if I could get some of that back and I I always want I want to still hope that like music sounds right so I was like this might be like the best chance I have at like music sounding okay <laughs> so this was very helpful. I was very fascinated with <laughs> learning about all this. Um, and then she told me of like a local, well, it's like 45 minutes away from my lit, where I live that I could go to that would offer the Medell brand. You know, interestingly, in my state, it's not very common to get the Medell brand. Like, Cochlear is like kind of, well, it's very popular in my area and it's just kind of like the go-to. So I had to like search a little bit to find uh, a medical center that offered the Medell brand. So luckily it was only 45 minutes was like bearable. I was, I was thankful it was that close. I was, it could have been worse because it's just hard to find. So I tried to call them and then I set up an appointment. So I couldn't get an appointment with that medical center for like a month. Um, she did warn me though that, so it had been about 10 years since I haven't heard any, much of anything on my left side. And she said, of course that may decrease your success rate, uh, just because it, your brain has to be used to hearing on that side. And she said it might be like harder for me to adapt, but she said it is possible. Um, of course, like, the sooner you implant after losing hearing, the better the success rate. But I think, I think it was, I think it's worth trying. I think that I'm, I'm still young. I could still adapt. I could probably get used to it. It may just take time. I, after, she said, after the surgery, there's a, a lot of, like, rehabilitation. You have to go to, like, several appointments and... They, they like make adjustments to the technology. You have to 
get used to hearing again. I might not understand speech like right away, but like it could get better with like practice. And she said with like the streaming feature, that would be like really helpful because I could stream audio like directly to the processor um, and then be forcing myself to use it and try to understand. And then I wouldn't be relying on my better ear, which could almost hold me back from like trying to learn how to hear. So this was like interesting. I was like, well, I'm willing to like give this shot and I, you know, worst case, this doesn't work at all. I just kind of go back to what I was doing before. But I had, I had hope that it would be fine or I, it would get better. And then she also, she gave me two, like, contacts of people kind of like in similar situation to myself, like not identical. And I talked to two different types of people. It was one person that lost hearing and then they got the cochlear implant right away afterwards. And then I talked to another person that waited 20 years before they got the cochlear implant. And they, both the cases were successful. And this gave me like hope that even though I'd waited 10 years, that I might be successful as well and that this was worth trying. So it was, I was very glad that I spoke to these people and it helped give me confidence in my decision. I also, I thought I, I found a better picture so I thought that I should show this. Well, this kind of shows like how the implant works again. And there's like, this is the outside part and there's the internal part. And then it comes back in and fishes into the cochlea and wraps around. So this helps to represent what is happening. And if, this is more like the original cochlea design where there's an earpiece and then there's a wire and it magnetizes to the internal part. But, I will show you this newer piece. So this is the like one of the Rondo threes. It's just this small piece that has to only magnetize to your head. So it's greatly condensed. They still have the the original design, and it's just a user's choice on if they want to purchase that kind or not. And also, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but the it's wirelessly charged, the Rondo 3, so you just put it on like a pad and it charges wirelessly. So I found this very nice as well. And you can get like, it's like a waterproof case that you can put on it so you, like you can go swimming with it. So that's really nice feature as well. And there's like a, like a telecoil boot adapter that you can get. So if you're still using like a telecoil like hearing aid, like me, like they were telling me that I'd have to use a hearing aid that has telecoil and then put the telecoil like boot adapter on the hearing aid and then I could use um, an R-Tone neck loop to help with streaming. Like then I could be able to stream from my phone to the neck loop to both the processor and the hearing aid at the same time. At this, That's the only way it can be done at this point. They said I can't Bluetooth stream to both a processor and a hearing aid at the same time because you can't like link it on your phone to two different devices so and anyways I don't have a Bluetooth hearing aid yet so I'm glad there's another option for this I also talked to the lady uh, the, uh, the Medell representative a little bit more about like types of risks with the surgery and she meant it or she mentioned like meningitis that might be like a possible risk and she said you could get like a vaccine and I I called the medical office that I planned to get an appointment with later and I asked them like what type of vaccine should I get and they were recommending that I get like Penumac, Penovax, Penumax I think something like that <laughs> vaccine and then I also got the meningitis vaccine as well just to be on the safe side so that's just something that I did I don't think that it's required but it might be recommended before the surgery so 
of course I, I waited a month and then I finally got my appointment with the medical center that offered Medell and they had me do another hearing test because I, I hadn't been to their facility before and then I went and saw the surgeon and I talked to the surgeon for a bit and I told him that I, I wanted to do Medell because they had like a longer electrode. Well then he he told me something I hadn't heard before. He's like, well, sometimes they have a longer electrode, but sometimes the longer like wire could get like stuck in the cochlea or it, if they can't like push it all the way in. So he said there's a possible risk of this happening and that then all the electrodes wouldn't be fully in the cochlea. And if they're not in the cochlea, then they wouldn't be helping me. So this this really threw me for a loop. I was like, oh my goodness, oh, why does this have to be happening? <laughs> but, and I was kind of like back and forth and very like concerned because I didn't know what to do. So I, I came home and I decided to do some more research about this. And on interesting online, they, Medell kind of thought this through. So they, they created a, a software called AutoPlan where you can measure the size of your cochlea and then they have different size electrodes so you can pick the right size one right size one for your cochlea so it fits correctly um, <laughs> so I called my Medell representative again and I asked her about this auto plan system and she unfortunately she told me that it's not available in the United States but she said that the 28 millimeter electrode is more, it's very typical. It works for like most people and she, that's what she recommended. And then I, I contacted my doctor again and he said that he did not have access to auto plan, which was unfortunate, but he was also recommending the 28 millimeter electrode. So at this point, I just kind of had to accept it I was, I was like, I still, I want that chance of getting lower tones, and if this is the typical electrode size, then I'm just going to have to go with that, and I, I'm, I'm going to hope for the best. I, they said even if it's not fully inserted, I'd still be able to hear, but I'd have, it may just be like a few tones less or something, which I was, I'm willing to take that risk, because I, I I want to have the chance of having a full insertion and I, I hope that it, it will go fine. So he, so since I was conflicted at first with my appointment, the doctor said, why don't we set up another appointment with you and the audiologist and you can talk more about the different types of cochlear implants. So a week or two later, I, I went back and I saw the audiologist and at this point, I was kind of like reconvinced that I was like, I'm just going to go through with Medell. And I talked to her about the different processors. She had one in the office and I could like hold it and get a feel for like what the size was. And they're fairly small. So they're, she said they're fairly durable. Like they're not like going to shatter if you like drop it, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> um, and she had me like pick a, a color they have like different like hair colors so now yeah, I picked like brown and she has there was like different like options um, that like accessories so you, they have like an audio link so this is a it works only with the cochlear implant the Medell cochlear implant so if I wanted to like Bluetooth stream just to the implant I could use this audio link device but in my case, I still use hearing aids, or I'm going to be using a hearing aid on my right side. So I, I want to, or I need to be able to stream to both of them. However, the the audio link, like upfront cost, is like around six hundred dollars. But if that R-tone neck loop that I was telling you about earlier is about like two hundred ish dollars, so. I had a decision on like what, which one did I want to like pay out of pocket. 
So I decided to, I'm going to get the audio link through insurance so that I can, if I wanted to or have the option to stream just to the processor, I could use the, the audio link. But then I also, I'm going to buy the Arto neck loop so that I have the option to stream to both my hearing aid and the Mazel cochlear implant. So that's the plan. <laughs> it also comes with, uh, you know, the waterproofing case and the, you know, the rechargeable pad. Uh, you know, and she says it comes in like a big backpack. So, <laughs> oh, and an important thing to note is when you, when you go to a facility, you should ask them if they're like a two processor facility. And my surgeon told me that all hospitals typically are, but it, this means that they will give you two of the outside processors, the Medell processors that you wear here. So you have like a backup. And I thought this was really nice feature because you never know like if something breaks or how long they'll last. So if you could find a medical center that will provide you with two of them, definitely choose that one. So at this point, we were, we were mainly all set to go. I have to, where they were gonna file with insurance and then I had to like wait to see if they were going to approve it or not. And then like a week uh, or two later, I got a, a letter in the mail telling me that they approved it. And this was, this was exciting. <laughs> and I, well then I have to like file paperwork with my work so that I could get out time for the surgery. And then I, I was trying to contact the doctor so that I, he could help me file paperwork. And then they, they had someone call me to schedule the dates and they, we scheduled a date for the surgery and then they schedule all these follow-up appointments and they, I scheduled up to three months in advance. I have multiple appointments that I have to go and I'm going to see an audiologist and a, like a speech therapist. I also, I see the surgeon again one time, like a follow-up visit after the surgery, but it's, I only see him one time again. The rest of it is mainly I have to see the audiologist several times to try to like make adjustments to the technology. Like you have to kind of like tinker with it and make it like change, adjust this here, make this sound a little bit better there. And then I like, I get used to it and it become more and more normal. And I, I've had this experience with hearing aids as well, because I, I had to go in and They'll make changes, they'll adjust the volume, tell me, it's like, does this sound okay to you? Is it too loud? Is it too quiet? Do you want us to raise this or do you erase that? And interesting with hearing aids, I've had this too, because I, every time I get a new hearing aid, my own voice sounds like a little bit different. Everything kind of sounds a little bit different. And, but I have to like adapt and then eventually it becomes like my new sense of normal. And then my old hearing aid, if I put my old one on, then that one sounds weird. So I imagine this will be similar. Like it'll sound really strange at first. It's going to be like really foreign, but the more I wear it, it'll get better and I'll get used to it and it'll become like my new sense of normal. And I, I find that so neat that like the human brain can adapt like that and I, I'm really amazed. <laughs> So I'm hoping that I can adapt and that it'll, it will become my new sense of normal. So at this point, all I have, I have to meet with the speech therapist uh, before the surgery. So I have that scheduled in a couple of weeks. And then I'll have to go do the surgery. And of course, since we're still in the time of COVID, I have to be COVID tested three days before the surgery and then I have to quarantine for three days before the surgery as well. So that, that's another thing that has to be considered. But I'm excited. I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> oh, something I forgot to mention is so sometimes people can be afraid of this surgery because of like the risk of like facial paralysis. And 
course I am afraid to. I mean, you're, there's very many nerve endings, but my surgeon told me that they try they use like a, a nerve monitor to try to like monitor the nerves, make sure that everything's like status quo, that they're not getting like too close to these nerves. And I know there's plenty of people that have been successful that haven't had any like these types of problems. I mean, there's a risk with like any surgery out there. It, always, if you like read the list of risks, it's always there. So I'm trying to like focus on the positive and that I'm hoping that this will grow smoothly and that there won't be any problems, but I am a little, a little nervous about this, but I, I have confidence that it'll be worth it. I mean, this could be like life changing for me. So I hope all goes well and I'll follow up uh, after the surgery. I'm going to make several progressive videos on how I'm doing, how I'm getting better, is it improving, and my experience. So enjoy. <laughs>